Now the goal here today is for me to be honest and interesting and provocative, but not so honest, interesting, and provocative to get suspended by this governor. So, and I'm, oh, I'm not joking. Uh, uh, the sheriff said that I'm just kidding. I know he has his finger on the speed dial to go to the stands right now. So, I, I, you know, I just thought we'd talk about politics because this is not my first time here. This is the first time in person. And I appreciate Gail, and, and I was talking to Don Madden earlier, and he told me that the group is actually, when it comes to your board of directors, is a third Democrat, a third Republican, a third NPA. And I think that says a lot about this organization. We need more of you out there. This is the most divided time I've ever seen. And I just hope it never slips into real political violence. I know what we saw on January 6th was, was, was awful. Uh, it couldn't be so much worse. And I just think that groups like this really give you hope that our democracy will survive everything that's going on. So I'm grateful to be your guest speaker. And grateful to have a friend like RJ Marizza, who uh, couldn't be here today, but he speaks really highly of the group. And I met Matt Metz, uh, who would be my counterpart in the 15th Circuit, where I'm Brian. And, you know, we work to do justice every day, and I have a lot of respect for the PDs. So let's, uh, let's go on a couple of things. First, uh, Sheriff Staley, um, MSNBC is a network on TV that is um, on, the, on the dial. It's near Fox News, but you have to keep going in black and kind of my TV stops at Fox. <laughs> <laughs> stops at Fox. Yeah, I get it. So yeah, so I go out morning Joe uh, once a week in CNN. And I love doing it because you get to talk about things in the country. And, and people said, hey, are you worried about that? It hurts you. Well, they said, well, first off, a lot of Republicans don't watch MSNBC or CNN. But in any event, I'm not, I'm a legal analyst on the shows. I, I'm not there to call people traitors and do all this stuff that is often done with these talking heads on TV. I just try to try to express how I see things legally. And although the legal questions are not part of the official program, I hope you'll have some questions about it. If we have time, I can talk all about my predictions as to what's going to happen after the midterms, because that's when it's all going to get real with the investigation into the documents at Mar-a-Lago or January 6th. So I definitely have some thoughts about that. But for now, let's talk about politics. And I was asked to talk about what I see for the state and federal elections. Well, I was a state senator for eight years. I'm a recovering politician in this role as state attorney. And I, I've been following the federal elections a lot closer. And part of that is because when it comes to state elections, I've seen this movie before. Elections happen, Democrats lose. I've just been seeing that way too often, and so I think that's going to happen again in 2022. In the state elections, I think the Republicans are going to sweep the cabinet, uh, and uh, Governor Sanders will be reelected. I think the Democrats are in danger of becoming a minority in the House where it's, it's a super majority of Republicans, and they're on the cusp of that, you can see that. And if you don't have at least a third in the House or the Senate, you can't block legislation, you really have no power. So that's, I don't have a lot of positivity there. Um, there's an old saying amongst the Republican Party in Tallahassee, because they continue to win elections even when our state was most, mostly Democratic. And they would say, we're not the Harlem Globetrotters, but we're always competing against the Washington Generals. <laughs> and, but yeah, that's, that was the saying. Now, Barack Obama won Florida, one of the reasons why he won Florida was that he brought in his own team. He went around the state Democratic Party and he brought in his own team and they won Florida. And after that happened, that has, a Democrat hasn't won Florida since then. And I, there's a feeling nationally that Florida can't be won right now when you have a state with 10 media markets. It's exorbitantly expensive. You can fund three states for what you would spend in Florida, and Florida you would probably lose, that's the thinking. So it's going to take some of the real, some of the best and brightest that they have in politics on the Democratic side to come in with real money to try to change that. Uh, but I don't know if they're going to be able to do it through the current party infrastructure. I think they're going to have to pull an Obama and try to either bring in some new people or 
work around it, and that's not going to happen in 2022. I think you have also some structural disadvantages. There's because Republicans are dominant in state government, they have a huge fundraising advantage. It's it's not even close. You see, I mean, how many Charlie Chris commercials have you seen on TV? Also, there's gerrymandering, which I've fought against for years. I, I don't like when anyone does it. It's you know drawing the districts to benefit your own party. I think it's it's awful, but that's the reality. Now, federal elections are different, though. Federal elections. I've heard this described once, I think, or is a jump ball. And I know there was a poll out there that scared a lot of Democrats, showing that the Republicans had now pulled ahead in the generic ballot in Congress by three points. But at the same time, there were three other polls, including one by Fox News, that shows the Democrats had had on the generic ballot. So we don't really know. I think this is, this is the most exciting election because usually you still have a sense of who's gonna win an election based on polling, based on just your feeling, your bones. I don't know this one. I think Republicans are likely to win the House because the headwinds are always against the party that controls the White House. Since World War II, the party that controls the White House has lost seats in the House and the Senate every time except for two times. One of them most recently was after 9-11. And I wrote down this, there's a average, the House uh, the, the party in control of the White House loses an average of 26 seats in the House in a midterm election. In the Senate, it's four seats. So if that happens, it would flip control of both houses to the Republicans. But I don't think that's going to happen this time. I think the, the Republicans are likely to win the House. I think it will be smaller than the 26 seats. I think it's more likely 15 seats. But I think in the Senate, the Democrats are actually going to remain in control. And here, here's why I think that. There, there are two things that run counter to history. I think the Dobbs decision really has motivated a lot of, of, of voters, mainly women voters, to, to vote in this election. A lot of them are being counted in the polls. You saw in Kansas, a very red state, that they overwhelmingly rejected increased abortion restrictions there. Now, it's different when you're voting on the issue of abortion versus voting for a candidate who has a litany of issues, but there have been a couple special elections since the Dobbs opinion that Democrats outperformed. And I think that's something that will make a difference. And if you're looking at the state polls, Republicans have to pick up one seat. So if they're going to pick up a seat, it probably will be at the bottom of all places. They are slightly ahead there. Laxalt, who's is a famous name in Nevada, could beat the incumbent Democratic senator. But if they lose, if the Republicans can't win in Georgia and Pennsylvania, then the Democrats keep control of the Senate. And then there are other seats. Ohio is close. Even Iowa, there was a close poll. Uh, North Carolina is close. If I had a bet, I would say uh, the Democrats will hang on by the one seat. But the reason why things are different is because, first, the Dobbs opinion, and secondly, uh, Donald Trump recruited candidates who are strong MAGA supporters, but they're less electable than candidates they beat in the primary. Look, if this guy McCormick would have won the primary for the Republicans in Pennsylvania, I don't think it would be a question who would win the Pennsylvania Senate seat. I think Adam, uh, John Fetterman would have lost to McCormick. But he's not running against McCormick, he's running against Dr. Robbs, who's a deeply flawed candidate. In Georgia, look, I've seen good candidates in my day, I've seen bad candidates, I've never seen a candidate like Herschel Walker in Georgia. I mean, look, look just because you buy a, a fake police badge in a gift shop doesn't make you a cop. And I just think that his many misdues are going to cost him. Now, the one thing about this is that there could be a wrong there's a libertarian candidate in that race. So it is very possible that the control of the Senate will not be decided in the midterm elections, but in December, when Georgia has its runoff election. So, yeah, the, the agony may be prolonged. So that is, is my uh, prediction. Another thing to look at is that Biden's job approval in the latest poll was the highest it had been in a year. And CBS News poll was 48%. Now, whether that's accurate or not, I don't know. I don't know how much of the polls. They've been wrong before, and so am I. I've been wrong before as well. But I do think that there are two different factors at play that could turn history on its head, where you may have split government, where the Republicans win the House, and then the Democrats keep control of the Senate. So uh, one more thing about that. 
And did anyone watch the debate with uh, Rubio and James? <laughs> oh, this is the most sophisticated group in the state of Florida. Okay. It was interesting. I, I, I was traveling, but I was watching clips on them. So I guess it's a half hand. So, okay. Uh, look, I thought Valentine did very well, but Florida is a reddish state and it seems to be getting redder. And I, I think it's going to be very hard for her to, to overcome all the headwinds out there. Uh, you notice how the prognosticators talk about the closed seats. Pennsylvania and Georgia and, and North Carolina and Nevada. They don't mention Florida. And there's a reason. It's because nationally people think that Florida's lost. And I don't know, I just anecdotally for me too, where I live, it's a very blue county. Uh, but I get the sense in our state that we are becoming more red. And I think the people moving down after COVID are coming from blue states, but they're trying to escape blue states, so I don't think that they're gonna vote blue. But you know, this is an election that is is wide open nationally. I just think Florida, uh, I, I just don't have the optimism I have uh, in other parts of the country as in, uh, in Florida. So, because I have a couple minutes for the questions, let me give you a prediction about legally what's gonna happen. Because I do this on TV, and this is what I think. After these internal elections, things are gonna get real. See, right now we're in a quiet period. The Department of Justice does not do um, any over-investigative things within a certain period within an election. They don't want to influence an election, so they stay quiet. But the investigation continues. But after the election, I think you will see indictments. And I think you're gonna see an indictment of the former President Trump about mar lago documents. And I say this not as hard as I say this, as a Occasional legal analyst on TV and a state attorney. Here's the thing. When it comes to January 6th, there are many layers between Donald Trump and the violence on that day. If you're going to charge the former president with any crimes, you have to tie him directly to the violence. It's not so easy to do. As Matt can tell you, you can come up with a lot of defenses. People say, well, seditious conspiracy. Seditious conspiracy requires you to have an agreement to enact violence to stop a government function. Cheering from the sidelines is not enough. Believing in the cause is not enough. You've got to actually have an agreement. Well, was there an agreement with someone to commit violence? I do not think we charge this seditious conspiracy. Plus, seditious conspiracy is so hard to prove. Right now, they're in court with the head of the old keepers, Sewer Rose, the guy with the eye patch. They're prosecuting him for seditious conspiracy and others. There hasn't been a successful seditious conspiracy in many years. It's a very hard thing to prove because you have broad First Amendment rights. Now, there are other crimes, though, that he could be charged with, Trump, and that could be conspiracy to defraud the United States and obstruction of an official proceeding. There's a federal judge, Judge Carter, who said that it is more likely than not that former President Trump committed those two crimes. And so those two are in play. But again, you have to have a direct link between Trump and the violence on that day for prosecutors to charge. And based on what we know now, not sure. I was asked on TV, well, isn't there an inference? Can't you infer that he was involved in the violence based on his comments from the lectern, based on knowing that his supporters were armed on their way to the Capitol? And I said, well, prosecutors don't like to charge on inferences. If we charge on inferences, Matt is deemed to blow us away more because we have proof beyond a reasonable doubt that you did it. We hate inferences. We like direct proof. Now it's different on the documents. On the, on the documents, there's a direct line between Trump and those documents. And he keeps making admissions in his public statements. He says, they're mine, they're mine. Or I kept them in cartons. Or hey, uh, the reports that said we're going to make a deal with the feds that if, uh, if you give me the Russia stuff, I'll give you the documents back. All this really hurts him. It shows knowledge, it shows intent. Now, the difference though, between January 6th and the documents is that although the documents, you have that clear line, prosecutors need to show that it's a case worth pursuing. Is it in the government's interest to be the first prosecutor in the history of our country to prosecute a former president? And to get there, you have to show something that is really damaging to our national security. If the documents matter is about Kim Jong-un's love letters, it's not gonna happen. You're not gonna see a prosecution. 
But if it's about nuclear information that could put our national security at serious risk, then I think you're going to see it. And if it's the name of foreign spies and he was showing it to people, then you're going to see it. So on one end, you have a crime on January 6th that deserves to be prosecuted. Everyone involved with the violence deserves to be prosecuted, but you have to have a direct tie, and that may not be there for Trump. On the other hand, you have a direct tie, but does it deserve to be prosecuted? And I think those questions still have to be answered. We have reports that involve nuclear materials, we have reports that involve foreign spies, but we don't know that for sure. And that's where I'm guessing that it does involve that, and I think he will be indicted after the interest. But I could be wrong, and we'll see what happens. I think it's much more likely he's indicted over the documents than on January 6th. So that, those are my predictions. I hope you have me back so you can see how wrong I am. But I think the best part of this program is when we hear from the most sophisticated uh, observers in our state, and that's all of you. So if we can start, and uh, we'll, we'll start with the questions. Thank you. All right. Uh, when you let it finish, you're just going to stand up and give your name and then ask a simple question. Yes, I'm, I'm Gary Walsh. In light of the fact that a substantial number of people in this country now believe that elections are fraudulent or unfair or anything like that, are you aware of whether or not state legislatures can overturn the election of a Senate election?
but it didn't take how does that say um, does that affect the law and how it's looked at in the future? Thank you for your question. So the English Schools Park and Master, which happened one county south of mine, and look, I respect the jury's decision, but my belief is if you can't get the death penalty for someone who slaughtered 17 innocents, most of the children, then when does it apply? And I think there will be a review of the death penalty in the legislature. Here's how I think things could go. There will be, be a review over whether to make it less than unanimous. See, what happened was Florida, for years, had a majority rule on the death penalty. It could be seven to five. And then the courts overturned that and said, that's unconstitutional. And so Florida, the Florida legislature in 2017 said, all right, now it's got to be unanimous. And not only does that have to be unanimous, You've got to make it unanimous on all the aggravators. So to get the death penalty in Florida, you have to not just show we did it. You've got to show that the actions were heinous, atrocious, and cruel, cold, calculated, premeditated. There were multiple people involved. You know, certain aggravators. All you need is one aggravator. Now, on the defense side, they have as many mitigators as they want. The defense can say his mother used drugs when he was in the womb. That's a mitigator. And then it's up to the jury to decide whether the person gets the death penalty. It's very hard to get the death penalty in Florida under the system. Because in this case, in Nicholas Cruz's case, the jury found that five aggravators were met unanimously. Yes, 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 yes. But that the mitigators, which they don't have to enumerate, overrode that. One juror, and then was joined by two others, said that, hey, maybe it's because his mother's drug use or whatever, we're going to give him life in prison. So I think the two changes that will be discussed will be, first, whether to make it less unanimous. What has happened since 2017 is that you have a new Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled it doesn't have to be unanimous anymore. That happened a year ago, but the legislature didn't respond. So now I think the legislature may review that. I don't know if they're gonna be able to pass something. They may get a supermajority, but they're gonna review it. A thing that I would support is this. I, 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 I personally think it should be unanimous, but one thing I would support is that I believe that the prosecution should have the final say. And it was my bill. When I was in the state senate, I passed a, a law that, I'm sorry, Matt, I was the one who did this. In the past, in every criminal case, the prosecution, which has the burden of proof, goes first in the closing, and then the defense has the final say. Well, in Florida, after we passed the law, we got to go first and last. We have a rebuttal. But not in death penalty cases in the penalty phase. So in the penalty phase, which is what we were all watching, the prosecution went first, and the defense had the final say. Would things have been different if the state had the final say? Maybe. But I think that's one change I would definitely support, that if we have the burden of proof, we should have the final say. So I have a lot I can say about that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll keep to my prior question. You know, earlier you mentioned about station names. I'm oh, sorry, that, that's a public defender. Uh, I'm the one that we've been making fun of. <laughs> so you talked about the polls, and as I'm sure many of us have noticed, a lot of the polls over the last few years have been wrong. And I know a lot of the pundits have said this is maybe because some folks are responding. I know it seems like the only people who can reach you now are those looking to get a car warranty from me. But do you think there's going to be a way to accurately predict what Americans want anymore, or are we just having to look to social media to make a feel for it? You know, the national polls have been correct over the years. It's the state polls that have been correct when people said, oh, look, the, the national polls show that Hillary was ahead of, of Donald Trump. Well, nationally, he was. I mean, she ended up winning five or six million more votes. But state polls are different, and the state polls are less sophisticated than they, they weren't as accurate. What I've been told is that the state polls know that they screwed up and they have tweaked their formulas. But we'll see. They they were they were pretty they were not that correct uh, again in the last presidential election. Again, the national polls seem to be on top of it when it comes to the national vote. But when it comes to state individual states, which is where it matters, they have been off. And that's why I say what I do based on you know what I've seen in my own gut, but that's why a lot of us are so often wrong. Uh, Tom Hankins from Palm Coast Magazine. Um, would you like to make a prediction on who you think the Republican candidate for president will be in 2024? Oh, man. 
early sex when it comes to juveniles and so forth. But, um, but in the main, it's capital cases that require a grand jury indictment. Last question, that'd be short. Short and sweet. Um, Jane Jen Sue Hugh, but I'd love to read Florida statutes. I'm so afraid they're wrong. At least one of us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. Dave, we have 